heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. Ed Ludlow, he's off. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Google, it unveils a host of updates to its AI products to show its offerings are enterprise ready. We'll break down what came from the company's annual cloud computing conference. Plus, Tesla may be headed for another sales decline back to back. That's according to some analysts on the street. We'll break down the outlook and hear from the former CEO of Tesla. And GM's cruise, well, it resumes robo-taxi testing over in Phoenix after grounding its fleet last year. We'll discuss that and so much more coming up throughout this hour. But now let's just get to what the markets are telling us. We had an about turn when it came to the overall equity market performance. We're actually trading lower ever since about 10.30 a.m. when we suddenly still a bit of a sell-off in the Nasdaq in particular of some four-tenths of percent. Now, not so in the bond market. We're actually seeing some buying ahead of the all-important CPI print as soon as tomorrow. We're looking at crypto on the downside off by 3.3 percent. So risk averse swelling in the market as we saw small business sentiment actually declined to the lowest in 11 years. We've also got breaking news from a micro perspective. And I want to move on to what's just happening on Boeing, because we do understand that we're getting some breaking news and deliveries for this particular company. Now, we're trading off by four tenths of percent on Boeing, of course, maker of the 737 MAX, besieged with issues, a near catastrophic incident earlier in January, January, of course. Now, this is as we see the first quarter of sales for Boeing be what we think is the worst that we've seen all the way back to 2021. People really seeing a slowing in production as well of 737 Maxes. Why? Because they need to make sure that the supply chain is ready, that they're managing to ensure that everything is safety first for Boeing more broadly. Let's just dig into this story because it does have this technology element to it. Bloomberg opinion columnist Brooke Sutherland is with us, I'm pleased to say. And let's just get to this breaking news and the deliveries from Boeing. They're poor. We probably expected it. We did. And I mean, again, it's, it's sort of a, a, a good story, bad story Boeing for Boeing here. And I mean, of course, the delivery numbers are not what they want them to be, not what their customers want them to be. But this is the result of the company really taking the time to hopefully get to the bottom of its quality control issues here. And remember, the FAA has capped Boeing's production rate at about 38 um, 737 jets per month. Now, they are nowhere near that pace right now, um, and it's going to slip even further because they're really trying to dial back on this concept of traveled work. And what that means is putting a priority on moving that plane through the production process, even if you don't have all the parts, even if the quality control isn't where it should be. Boeing is moving away from that. They're taking a step back and really trying to drill into safety and their engineering processes. Now, that is a good thing in the long run, but certainly not going to show up in their delivery numbers right here in the short term. And let's just reaffirm what the delivery numbers are, Brooke, because it's 83 jets were delivered in the first quarter, lowest since the second quarter of 2021. Interestingly, 29 jets in March were sold, and that's 24 737 Maxes. It clearly just shows the importance of this particular model. And I'm noting that they were booking 113 gross orders in March and only two cancellations. Is any of this really putting off demand for the 737 Max? I don't think that it is uh, overall because you have a duopoly uh, in aircraft manufacturing and Airbus is sold out of its marquee narrow body jet model into the 2030s. So if you were an airline, and you need planes, you really only have uh, one option in the short term, and that is Boeing. And I think that, to your point, shows just how important this airplane is and how important it is that Boeing ultimately gets this right and gets to the bottom of what their quality control issues are. Now, they are losing market share to Airbus. The Airbus has been able to pull ahead, specifically in that narrow body jet market. Um, they are winning more orders, but you're certainly not seeing demand fall off a cliff for Boeing. And I think that does provide some support, but also some encouragement for the company to just try to figure this out and get the customers the jets that they want to buy they want to fly from Boeing and let's just dig into Airbus because we're anticipating deliveries there in fact it was under pressure more than the rest of the French benchmark earlier today what are we seeing in terms of ultimate economic sentiment hitting both Airbus and Boeing and is there any sort of tech angles we can weave in here I mean, I think air travel demand has held up pretty well. I mean, even in this inflationary environment, you're still seeing strong demand for air travel. Um, and, you know, really both Boeing and Airbus have a demand problem, uh, or sorry, have a supply problem at the end of the day, not a demand problem. Um, and, you know, the, the onus is on them to be able to churn out these airplanes um, and get them to customers. 
Love having you on Bloomberg Opinion columnist Brooke Sutherland jumping on the latest delivery numbers. Let's get back to our bread and butter right now, though, because Google is having a big event surrounding cloud. It's, in fact, unveiling a host of updates around its artificial intelligence offerings today. And it's really trying to show how this technology is enterprise ready after, well, some pretty obvious mishaps earlier this year when it came to consumer use. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Davey Albert. And really, Google's trying to shake off what has been happening earlier in the year when it comes to Gemini application across particularly image generation. How fit for purpose is it from an enterprise perspective? Yeah, um, hi, happy to be here. Um, Google is really framing these announcements as this is Cloud's moment in enterprise. And it says that the, the same risks that were around for the consumer product are not really there for um, enterprise customers because marketers, you know, client, cloud clients have a lot more controls over the outputs. Um, Google has said that it is providing up to like 19 fine-tuned controls for um, people who use its enterprise, enterprise platform. And so with that level of control, you can kind of make sure that the images and outputs that the AI is generating aligns with your brand's image. It's really interesting. Earlier today, we were looking at how Best Buy is integrating AI, generative AI, Google, a partner for them. Who are the kind of businesses who are adopting Google, using Google Cloud as well to ensure that they got the compute power to be building generative AI systems themselves? Uh, it's a lot of startups, actually, AI, generative AI startups in particular. Um, one, one bit of news that came out today is that uh, Google is continuing to sign up these kinds of customers for its cloud platform. So uh, last year in August, uh, Google said that it had signed up up to 70% uh, of AI unicorns um, and Today, they're saying that that figure is up to 90% of all generative AI unicorns are using its cloud computing services now. Interesting that they're really focusing on that particular area. I'm also just want to know how good it is, Davey. I mean, this has been the perennial issue. Many have felt, even though they were at the very well, iterations of generative AI. It was because of the work and the R&D that Google did that got us to where we are today. But they've lost market share and mind share, really, to the likes of OpenAI. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Google says that there are a couple of things that differentiates itself from the competition. So one thing that is pretty unique to them is that they have um, Gemini 1.5 Pro that is underlying a lot of these AI offerings for enterprise. And that model has the longest context window, Google says, of any AI model. It can process up to 1 million tokens at a time, which you know tokens are essentially like words or pieces of words. And that means that marketers can upload um, audio files, photos, images, um, videos, uh, potentially thousands of them. And that will be the basis from which the AI generates new content. Um, another thing that Google says is unique to them is that they are more open compared to other cloud computing platforms. And, you know, Thomas Kurian, who we spoke to ahead of the announcements today, didn't name any specific competitors, hmm. but that seemed to be referring to open AI. And, you know, one thing that he emphasized was Google Cloud wants enterprise customers to be able to choose a platform, not an AI model. So within its platform, it actually yeah. makes available um, a bunch of different models, including Anthropics and Metas, and developers can pick and choose what AI models they want to use. A lot of this all comes back to chips, Davey, and it looks as though Google is focusing more on in-house chips. It's notable that NVIDIA is down on the day. It's notable that Bloomberg Intelligence is saying, look, there's a deepening relationship between Broadcom and Alphabet. What do you make of the chip moves? Yeah, Google has long been working on its own chips, but, you know, especially with the demand increasing for AI computing power, this is something that they can kind of bring, get their experience, bring it to bear on, on this effort. So one of the announcements today was that Google was rolling out its own advanced chips um, and hopefully that will help it to compete 
with the likes of NVIDIA and other chip makers, um, Google's cloud strategy and its AI strategy on the whole appears to be, let's have our fingers in kind of every pot um, and keep pushing the ball forward on AI to make sure that we remain relevant after having laid the groundwork for a lot of the AI innovations that we see today that are being used across all sorts of companies, including open AI. Well, the event continues on the other side of America. Davey Alba, we thank you so much for bringing us all the latest coming out of a key cloud event for Google. Meanwhile, coming up, Tesla's former CEO and co-founder says it would be a shame if the EV maker scraps plans for a cheaper car. We'll get his take on that and the EV transition more broadly. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Tesla, once upon a time, had a previous CEO, Martin Eberhard. In fact, he was one of the, the true founders of the company. He said Tesla should rethink its plans to scrap the low-cost electric car that seems to have been being reported on of late, that the company needs to focus on costs to keep its sales growing. He sat down with Bloomberg's Haslinda Amin in Hong Kong and starting off on whether or not the EV transition is actually slowing down. Take a listen. I don't, I don't think that's true. Maybe Tesla is slowing down. Uh, but the whole auto industry has slowed down, I've noticed, in the last year or two, particularly in the U.S. So, yeah. And in terms of Tesla's own breakneck, breakneck uh, growth, is that over? Some say perhaps, yeah, it's done and dusted. Um, I, don't, I mean, looking at, at one small downturn, maybe it's over, maybe it's not. I think it, in some ways it doesn't really matter because the EV... Uh, uh, phenomenon has taken over the entire auto industry. We'll see EVs coming out of China here like crazy in the next several years. The Korean EVs are, are amazing. And even in the U.S., there's many companies making EVs still. So the current growth pace is going to be the new normal? I think that eventually we're going to see all of the cars replaced with EVs over the years. And, and who the players will be, not everybody will survive. I think Tesla probably will. Do you, do you buy the spin that perhaps Tesla is in between two growth waves? <laughs> Maybe that's the way to look at it. Um, I, I read recently that, uh, that Tesla has decided not to pursue their Model 2, the low-end car, because they don't think that they can compete with the low-end Chinese cars. I think it's a shame. They might want to rethink that. Um, but it seems like a better market than that gigantic truck they make. Why do you think Tesla is so reluctant now? I mean, and why has it been so difficult and so slow to get to the cheaper versions of those EVs? It's a new technology, and it's difficult to drive the technology price down. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it, the, the profit of high volume, uh, sorry, the profit of, of, uh, of high-end luxury cars is much higher, and it's easy to make money in that space. But when you want to move down into lower price markets, you need to have the ability to, to, to build at a, at a very different level. So where is Tesla going wrong or where should Tesla be focusing on to get to where it needs to get to in terms of those uh, cheaper uh, models? Tesla needs to be focused on cost. Tesla okay. needs to be focused on cost instead of focusing on, on mm, technology for the sake of technology. Mm. Does it need new talent, initiatives? Oh, I don't think so. I think, I think they'll, they'll, they'll manage along just fine. Mm. Uh, in terms of Tesla's future, maybe five, ten years down the road, where do you see Tesla? Because some say that perhaps, you know, it could be concentrating on EVs, but it could be other projects as well. How do you see Tesla uh, in terms of growth in the next five to ten years? What I'd like to see is Tesla succeeding to, to make EVs into, into the foreseeable future. I'd like to see them continue to make EVs and, and drive into the rest of the market space that they aren't occupying right now. Whether they do that or not is not my say. Mm. Uh, you are with Volkswagen for quite some time, mm -hmm. or in fact two years yes. after you left Tesla, uh, yet when it comes to their EV strategy, they've not been able to replicate what Tesla has done. Why is that? Uh, let's just say innovator's dilemma, right? Uh, Volkswagen has been very, very successful, more successful than, than pretty much any other company making gasoline and diesel powered cars. Uh, it's hard for a company like that to be pushing a technology that suggests that buyers ought to buy something other than the cars that have been making them money for all these years. It's, so, just, it's hard to be the ones who invent the technology that make your own products obsolete. The former Tesla CEO, Martin Eberhard, there, along with our own Haslinda Amin. And now let's just 
come full circle with where Tesla is at the moment and maybe headed for, in fact, perhaps vehicle sales declining in another quarter, so back-to-back -back drops after surprising investors with that drop that we saw in the first three months of the year. It's all according to analysts such as Robert W. Baird. Bloomberg's Craig Trudell is here to sort of sum up what is the narrative in the market. Look, we almost front-run this with the stock move. The beginning of this year, we've seen Tesla significantly underperform. And now that's starting to be borne out in delivery numbers. Who thinks that this sort of decline is going to be continuing? Yeah, I mean, this idea that Ben uh, Callow at Robert W. Baird, as you mentioned, uh, expects uh, the second quarter to be another decline, I think, uh, you know, just looking at, at the chart we have on, on the terminal with, with that story, uh, it does speak to this idea that there will be, you know, at least in his estimation, a bit of a tick up in terms of, you know, just from the seasonally low first quarter. Uh, but to his point, uh, the, the comparison from a year ago is tougher. And I think, you know, a, as you mentioned, uh, just early this year, you know, the stock was underperforming because we kept hearing analysts after analysts, uh, you know, talk about this idea that the outlook for sales, you know, wasn't that great. And then, you know, lo and behold, the company comes in way below analyst expectations. I think this really uh, sort of leads people to second guess, you know, their assumptions for this company through the rest of, of the year. Let's just talk a little. This is a great street wrap. Bloomberg does a wonderful job of summarizing what all the analysts out there are saying. And many have been wanting to talk about this robo taxi focus versus perhaps the concern of no longer having a model to a cheap car. What do you make of some of the views on the robo taxi? I think their skepticism is sort of borne out just from the year after year pattern of, of Musk talking about robo taxis being just around the corner. Uh, you know, I think we're actually coming up on the five year anniversary of Musk holding the first uh, Tesla Autonomy Day. When I, I remember, you know, covering this with Dana Hull and, and uh, you know, watching Musk talk about this idea that, you know, by the middle of 2020, he was saying that, you know, the million Teslas that were on the road were going to be capable of, of turning into robo taxis and that people would be able to even fall asleep in their car. Obviously, that has not come to pass. And so, you know, the expectation that uh, Tesla is going to be able to, to deliver a fully self-driving vehicle, you know, I, I think Wall Street's going to need to have uh, some show there. Yeah, for now, 20 buys on the stock, 14 sells, and a price target that does seem to be declining a little bit. Craig Trudell, great to have you wrapping it up. Thank you. Meanwhile, look, General Motors' cruise autonomous driving business well, is preparing to actually resume testing of their robo-taxis with safety drivers in Phoenix. This marks a pretty important step in its attempts to restart service. It's after grounding its fleet last year, remember. The company is set to announce and begin the testing as early as today. In recent months, Cruz has been in talks with officials in 20 metropolitan areas where it previously ran cars or had started mapping in preparation to run them. This is Bloomberg Technology. Neuro One is a developmental stage company committed to brain impact technology and has just completed its first surgery involving its 1RF ablation system. Now that's actually a device that can be used for mapping and then targeting brain areas with abnormal activity. It's used to treat a range of neurological conditions such as Parkinson's disease. Pleased to say, joining us now is the CEO of Neuro One Medical Technologies, Dave Rosa. And well, congratulations on this surgery that I understand occurred just as recently as yesterday and I want to get your perspective on how big a seismic shift this is for you. I, I think it's a tremendous tremendous accomplishment for the company but I also uh, think for the field I mean what patients have been dealing with that undergo these surgeries is they've they've had to come in for uh, an invasive diagnostic surgery where the surgeon tries to locate the problematic area in the brain and then those patients uh, would be sent home and then rescheduled for a therapeutic surgery where um, another device would have to be placed to remove the tissue. And um, what we're able to do now with this technology is use the same device to do both uh, mm -hmm. in the same hospitalization, which we think will cut down on hospitalization, surgeries, and, and even cost for the procedure. So we, we think this is a, a major accomplishment. Putting chips or other devices 
within the brain. The oxygen seems to have been sort of sucked out of the room by companies such as Neuralink. And I'm interested in your perspective. Actually, put the context around this. How long has this been happening? How long have we been putting bits of equipment, devices into the brain to be ensuring that we know really what's going on there? Uh, for actually many, many years. Um, so it's, it's not new for brain mapping. And even with companies like Neuralink and Synchron, um, you know, putting um, BCI devices um, uh, in patients to help them move a computer mouse by just thinking, that, that's been done uh, for quite a long time. I think the eloquence of how they're doing it now is much, much different by using wireless systems or less invasive systems where you're able to, to place the devices through a blood vessel. So that, that's really where the advancements uh, have come recently. You're putting electrodes in the brain, and I'm interested as exactly what the different products are that you're developing and what they actually do. Yeah, so um, the electrodes that we have, and the goal of this company was to always be able to use the same device to do mapping, to do ablation, and to do stimulation, which is uh, another therapeutic treatment for uh, uh, for conditions like uh, Parkinson's disease and, and even epilepsy. But really what excites me about the future of this technology is not just the things that companies like Neuralink are trying to accomplish, which is uh, really be able to help people that are paralyzed. I think the next wave of utilization for devices like ours is to be able to deliver new gene therapies and drugs and deliver them precisely to the part of the brain um, that's uh, causing the issues for patients, uh, and then also be able to simultaneously monitor the efficacy. And then other indications, which um, I think, uh, again, will be big opportunities are Alzheimer's um, uh, primarily, uh, and then also conditions like severe depression. Mm. Uh, scientists have found the areas of the brain that uh, control uh, emotions, and there's also been some, some really exciting work done by the Mayo Clinic on improving short-term memory uh, using electrodes like this for Alzheimer's patients. Dave Rosa, we always wish the future was sooner than it currently is. But thank you for painting out exactly what NeuroOne is doing. You're of NeuroOne Medical Technologies. We thank you for the time. Meanwhile, coming up, that we've got to be talking a little bit about something in the near future of Bitcoin, the halving upon us almost. We'll be discussing that with Trust Machines, Rina Shah, coming up next. Meanwhile, well, let's just keep a close eye on what's happening with a French company, Atos, currently under pressure by some 13%. We know that this business is looking at restructuring. It's got a heavy debt load. They're seeking 1.2 billion euros in equity and debt for a rescue plan. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Quick check on these markets that are bouncing off of their lows, but suddenly we did get a turn in the equity market and we're still under pressure by some four tenths percent on the Nasdaq 100. Some of the momentum names in particular under pressure and thinking of Vinia, thinking of Meta in particular, selling off. Even as we see actually bond yields coming down, money going into the bond market ahead of that all important CPI print coming tomorrow. We're currently off by about four or five basis points when you're looking at a two year, but really across the curve, we're seeing a little bit of dip buying. We're seeing Bitcoin under pressure as risk assets sell off. We're off by some almost 4%. We're going to be digging into Bitcoin in a moment, but well off of those $73,000 level highs, 68923 Moving on, some of the individual movers I want to shine a light on. Tesla actually managing to be one of the biggest point contributors to the NASDAQ 100 today. We're up 1.2%. Many trying to digest really what the announcement in August surrounding robo-taxi innovation is going to mean for a company that maybe is pulling back a little bit on some of the cheaper offerings that they were planning and really trying to read the room on where Tesla is going and how much they've been sold off already. Cisco getting an uplift from certain analysts, Morgan Stanley liking it up 2.2%, really feeling that there's been too much bearishness around this particular name. Galaxy Digital, interesting one, of course, traded over in Canada. We all know Mike Navogratz, who's leading this particular business, off by 18%, hit hard. Why? They're raising money, $125 million of it. They're doing an all-stock deal, really, with Canical Genuity, who are buying up some of their overall stock, managing to put this towards working purposes and ultimately continuing to keep on fueling the business, but we're off significantly on the back of that supply. So keep an eye on some of the crypto names as crypto is indeed under pressure. And let's just dig in a little bit there because while we've seen crypto selling off today, the momentum has been 
up and to the right of late. And that's because we've had plenty to talk about from an ETF perspective, but also coming up in a couple of weeks, that highly anticipated Bitcoin halving event, which has a history of lifting the price even more. And we're hoping, there are hopes more generally, that maybe the high in light of Bitcoin's current rally of more than 50% to a record high this year might actually have, still have room to run. What's exactly going on? Let's break it all down. And what the halving means. Take a listen. On the horizon is a preordained event that will change the business of Bitcoin forever. It's called the halving. It will become much more difficult for miners to produce new coins. After the halving, margins will be cut overnight by 50%. So the halving might be good for the holders, but it's not necessarily good for the miners. Some companies are either bulking up for scale or finding ways to diversify. Some companies that in the past were Bitcoin mining, they've shifted over to training these ever bigger AI models. This is kind of a moment for Bitcoin that is arguably one of its biggest ever. 21 million. That is the total number of Bitcoins that can ever exist. And over 19 million of those have already been awarded. The halving is the mechanism designed to create scarcity and control Bitcoin's limited supply. It happens every four years, and when it does, all future block rewards are cut in half. The halving is a natural phenomenon in Bitcoin that disciplines the entire market and forces it to become more efficient. You can watch the rest of this episode on Bloomberg.com. But now let's dig into the halving and more broadly the ecosystem of Bitcoin with Rina Shah, Vice President of Operations and Products at Trust Machines. You build applications for Bitcoin. It's all about a broadening out of the ecosystem. But Rina, when we go to the halving, how much of a fundamental lift will this be, do you think? First, I want thank you so much for bringing me here on today. I'd say Bitcoin halving is going to have a huge impact on Bitcoin markets today. We are in a very unique cycle because we are 10 days away from having, we're at an all time high and a spot ETF just came in America. So at this point, what I'm seeing is that the supply will be shrunk. We will have less Bitcoin entering in after April 20th, but the demand is at an all time high from institutions and retails coming into Bitcoin. What this means is that more people are going to be looking to Bitcoin to turn it from a passive asset to a productive asset. And that's what our company Trust Machines is all about building Let's, real products to do more with their Bitcoin. Go to the passive bit, though. With your experience as the head of the exchange over at Binance US, is it true that we've seen more institutional players come in? Or of late, have we just been powered by more retail accessing spot ETFs in the US, for example? I think it's a little bit of both that we're seeing on the institutional side, more and more are coming in because they now have new access to Bitcoin. But on the retail side, we are seeing new developments with Bitcoin through ordinals, Bitcoin NFTs, and it is creating a brand new supply of artists and creators building with Bitcoin to create a new form of art. This is a very different retail phenomena that we're seeing. Hmm. Okay, different from the NFTs that we all love to talk about a few years ago, Rena. And I'm interested when you're thinking about a Bitcoin network that many have thought of was usually, look, either something that you were gaming in some way, it was more of an asset that you, you bet upon, or indeed stored value, if that was the way that you saw it. Largely, you know, this was something that wasn't being built on from a smart contract perspective that we saw over with ETH. But you're trying to change the narrative around that a little bit, as you say, make it more productive. Where is the production coming from, Web3 apps that are being built, what are the most lucrative for you? So I think if you were to think about Bitcoin as a market opportunity, we have $1.3 trillion in BTC as an asset class. So we have surpassed the store of value, but we are trying to move into now the medium exchange. If you were to build applications on top of Bitcoin, like layers, like what Lightning is building, or DeFi, or stablecoins, or anything under the sun, you can have a, a larger economy as a flywheel on Bitcoin. So think about this. All of the value is what we see on the surface, but the untapped potential of a $100, $200 billion market is below the surface, and we are just scratching the surface through new layered technology on Bitcoin. Like what? Like what technology? What use cases? A lot of different use cases. The first is the idea of Bitcoin L2s. Bitcoin is having a moment, and a lot of people are thinking about how to scale Bitcoin by creating new layers, like what Ethereum has with 
Polygon or other L2s with Bitcoin. This means that I can have smart contracts with Bitcoin, meaning that BTC latent capital, that asset can be deployed directly into DeFi, um, RWAs, thinking about tokenized treasury bills, kind of the world is the limit on the idea of new new products being built on Bitcoin, but using the most secure and stable blockchain in all of the world. So real world assets are key focus. I'm interested in your business in particular, Trust Machines. What sort of revenue growth are you seeing? How, how are you managing to bring in money at the same time as the costs that are involved? There is always cost in doing any sort of business. There's no secret in that. Our product lines are very diversified. One of our products is a leading Bitcoin wallet called Leather, meaning not your keys, not your crypto. We help Americans and people all over the globe get access to Bitcoin and secure it safely here at home. The other product that we're building is a little bit revolutionary and very new. We are bringing the Web2 functionality of a TLD, so a, a domain, if you say, as a passport into Web3 and Bitcoin, meaning I take my digital identity everywhere we go. Okay. Feels like we need to get you on a little bit more to dig into my new digital identity and whether or not that's having to scan my eye or not. Rina Shah, I'm really pleased to spend some time <laughs> with you, Vice President of Operations and Products over at Trust Machines. Really fascinating across the crypto sphere. Meanwhile, watching shares of Intel today, let's just keep an eye more broadly on some of the chip makers as we see really a bit of a sell off that's been happening across the world. Now, we're actually seeing a spike higher in the world of Intel right now, almost managing to trade flat on the day. This, as we see an, an, an announcement more around Gaudi 3, they're saying they're unleashing enterprise AI with Gaudi 3, AI open system strategy, new customer wins is what's coming out. This is Intel's Vision 2024 and really breaking down some of those proprietary rules, they say, to bring choice to ent enterprise generative AI markets. Isn't it interesting that seems to be coming on the same day as Google's announcements and also they're teaming up with Broadcom. So we're just seeing a release of new AI hardware to compete with NVIDIA. NVIDIA, of course, under pressure today. This is Bloomberg Technology. Investing in privately held companies can be difficult for retail investors in particular, but Destiny Tech 100 is trying to change that. It's a publicly traded closed-end fund. It holds shares of private tech startups, think Stripe, SpaceX, OpenAI, Discord, Epic Games, and it trades publicly now on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker DXYZ. But its investments are private, they're illiquid, and the fund plans to expand its holdings to include stocks in 100 startups. Now, after the companies it has invested in sell or go public, the returns from those investments can be distributed to shareholders as a dividend or indeed reinvested back into the fund. As you saw, it's been incredibly volatile. In fact, paused several times today for trading, having risen about 800% in the last few trading days. But we want to get back to the opportunity of investing in the secondary market, private companies. Drew Glover, I'm pleased to say, is with us. He's a partner at Fiat Ventures and founding partner of Fiat Growth. And that is where you help advise, scale, bring to bear fintech companies in particular. You then get really close to them, understand, take investment chunks. The secondary market is something that you've been keeping an eye on. What do you think of it? Yeah, so I, I've been keeping a close eye on this mainly because we work with private companies. Um, and I, I think what we've seen over the last, call it 24 months, is this, this shift from a momentum market into a fundamentals market. And a lot of companies that were highly, highly valued a couple years ago have really been dormant in the private market. There's not, haven't been a ton of IPOs. Um, there's been a lot of companies building, optimizing, really trying to become profitable during this downtime. And what that's created is a lot of really incredible opportunities in the secondary market, but also at the same time, some uh, not so exciting uh, secondary market opportunities. Okay. And that is mainly because um, dependent on kind of where the private market sits, there's always massive trends, massive things that drive overvaluation, massive rounds, big valuations. And so, you know, what we're seeing in this market, in the secondary market right now is I think the really, really educated buyers are making some really smart decisions, but it's still very easy to get caught up in the hype <laughs> of what some of these trends are. AI, you know, I could are talk- Are you trying to, to tell me that open AI isn't a good deal in the secondary market? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I actually can't tell you what the number is from an open AI standpoint, but the opportunity open AI has 
brings a number on their head that they still need to grow into. Mm -hmm. And when, when we're talking about trends in the private market, the valuations that are put out there are numbers that they expect companies to grow into. And so when you think about it, you're betting on the futures of a company versus some of these other ones that have done really well and have stayed really quiet. And um, because they're not public, the information on their success isn't as widespread. And so you really need to be an insider to understand where the value sits in the secondaries. So sort of a cautionary tale to retail investors who need to actually do a little bit more digging than just go to the e most hyped name on a by across headlines or indeed on social media. How do you start to get that insight? Where do you start peeling the onion from? Yeah, and, and so, you know, I, I think, you know, there's a number of these different companies right now that are really kind of bringing together, you know, these consortiums of different private companies. Um, some are on the public markets. Other ones are, are, are really just building different companies to kind of roll up some of these different pieces. I mean, you need to, ta you need to, attach, yourself to the, attach yourself to the right minds that are, that are leading this charge. Well, at the same time, um, you know, you kind of just need to know the right people. Um, mm. Uh, you know, for example, I, I know the mafia of a number of different, you know, really incredible companies that aren't quite public, pu quite public yet. And, um, you know, that is just uh, the nature of me being in San Francisco, you know, knowing a, n a number of different people. But you really need to not only like know within your network, but you also need to stay close to the people that are living and breathing this every day. If you don't, you will get caught up in the hype cycle. The private company story in the in the kind of publication market that is the greatest story ever been told because you don't have to work underneath the kind of public market um, uh, scrutiny of, yeah. of how you, you really talk about your business uh, to the world. Um, so, you know, you can't get caught up in the hype because it can really hurt um, if you're trying to lead into the secondary space. Okay, so let's go for real versus hype. Yeah. Where has been the real work been done from a fintech perspective this is your area of expertise yeah. is it b2c is it b2b where some of the companies been doubling down on generating revenue and actually profits dare i say yeah so i think um i think there's some big opportunities from a secondary standpoint in the direct to consumer space i think what happened uh in this transition from momentum to fundamentals is a lot of people wrote off large neobanks a lot of people wrote off a lot of the really large consumer plays in fintech and don't get me wrong, some aren't doing very well, some are doing better than you could ever imagine. Um, Is there a discerning trend as to which ones are doing better than you'd ever imagine? Yeah, well, I... In terms, of, in terms of trends, again, this is information that, that's just like not widely available. However, um, you know, what's happened is, is what was happening before, what was happening before is we were really in the middle of a brand war. Mm -hmm. It was a number of different neobanks and consumer fintechs that were all just competing to have the biggest brand. And that meant they were just spending a ton of money on Facebook and Instagram. And then once the, the momentum market shifted into the fundamentals market, you know, we pulled back on spend a little bit and we started looking internal to the business. How can we make it so we're not just building a company just based off interchange? You know, how do we make it so we can uh, get more products in front of our different users and make recommendations recommendations, maybe driven by AI that'll help improve their financial health and their financial life, and really building internally to build additional products to drive revenue and build existing gro or growth channels within the existing network to make it so we can drive more profitability, drive more revenue, drive more value to the end user. And so what's been happening from a private market perspective is these engines that were one note have now created multiple engines within their business yeah. to create long lasting value. What's interesting is we might well get a public exit from a key fintech and I'm thinking of Klarna. Everyone yeah. wants to see what Stripe's going to do at some time. But the buy now and pay later ship is where Klarna is wrapped up. They're also ta talking a very interesting generative AI game at the moment and the productivity they're seeing very from that. Is that going to be an opening for other companies that you're currently advising and taking stakes in? Will there be more fintech? companies going public? Yeah, so I think there will be more fintechs going public. Again, the, the, we're talking about a cohort that's been around for the last, you know, 15 years, you know, because I, I, I think- Old, a, old guy. Yeah, a lot, a lot of these folks were hoping to go public a couple years ago, and, and you know, what they've really done, like I was saying, is, is really, you know, optimize the engine that they've been building. Um, I think Klarna is a really interesting one. I mean, like hot take here, like I don't think there's going to be a lot of other buy now, pay later businesses that, mm. that get to reach the IPO space. Um, Too crowded? It's, it's, it is crowded, but at the same time, um, it's a capital intensive business. Um, from the standpoint of, of one, uh, you need to really market it as a brand, although it's a B to B to C product, meaning I'm selling to a business and I'm trying to own real estate on their checkout page. 
when us as consumers land on that checkout page and we see a firm or Klarna, we need to feel confident in that brand for us to go into debt with that brand. Um, so uh, that's one piece is just like the, the, the brand side. The other one is it's a, it's a debt facility. And, and one thing we've seen is the debt facility market's taken a big hit in terms of um, these debt providers providing risk uh, to other companies. Um, I've seen this in the, you know, the, the very early stage market. I've seen it in the high market. Um, and what we've seen with Klarna is, you know, luckily they are so far along. What they really are is they're an underwriting tool. Just like a firm, they're able to offer, they're op able to offer micro lending options for no interest at all. Um, although they did just, um, they just did just input a late fee charge. You know, there's some things that they're doing to try to optimize. We talked about AI. Yeah. They're also potentially laying off 700 different folks to bring yeah. ChatGPT in as their uh, their customer service arm of the business, which they've run some really interesting tests on that have been really successful. But um, to get to that stage, yes. you have to raise billions of dollars. Well, we'll get you back on as and when that goes public and what are the new ones to keep an eye on. Drew Glover, partner at Fiat Ventures, founding partner of Fiat Growth. We thank him for his time. Meanwhile, coming up, we're going to give you more details on Elon Musk's latest live conversation on X. But also, let's check in on what's happening, what we anticipated. Airbus's deliveries. We had Boeing earlier in the show. Airbus has delivered 63 aircraft in March. And they stand, year to date, 142 aircraft. Gross orders were 137. Now, 163 aircraft in March. That's a lot more than Boeing was doing in March. This is Bloomberg Technology. Last year it was about a chef supply. People could not get enough um, NVIDIA chefs particularly. Um, this year is starting to transition to a voltage transformer supply. If you look out a year or two, or certainly three years, um, it's just electricity availability. Hmm. So uh, that's th th those are the constraints on the hardware side. You know, Musk there talking about chip supply shortage in the AI space in particular, of course, Tesla an AI player, but so too is now Grok, which is developing. We, he was speaking on X yesterday with Nikolai Tangen, and he's the CEO of Norge Bank Investment Management. It manages about $1.6 trillion, in fact. Uh, in fact, it's the largest single owner of the world's stock markets. Musk actually began the live discussion by talking up how well the service worked. But pretty soon, the audio cut out on X, and it happened again and again, and goodness... We'll have to dig into it with Bloomberg's Business Week columnist, Max Chafkin. I mean, aside from technical glitches, Max, what was the key takeaway, you think, from that conversation? I mean, you know, Elon Musk uh, has been, in this conversation and a couple other forums over the last week, been painting a very sunny picture of AI, particularly around Tesla and, as we heard here, Grok. You know, he also, he, in addition to saying, like, we're getting past these chip shortages, as you just heard, he said that they are using a huge number of NVIDIA chips on the next version of Grok, which he also talked up. I believe he said 20,000 um, H100 chips, which, you know, that's an insane amount of money. That's, you know, you, you, each one of those chips is between, like, 10, and fifteen thousand dollars, so it's a it's a huge sum of money. And I think the real question is, how does Grok XAI, which is Elon Musk's AI venture, how does it how does he finance it? Does he raise outside capital? Does he somehow does it somehow get closer to Tesla or closer to Twitter, uh, now, now called X. I, I think that's one big question because these large language models, as, as people know, are not inexpensive to, to train and they are all, and they are not inexpensive to run. Elon's in damage control right now? Yeah, so we, we heard last week uh, some really discouraging sales figures, which Musk had kind of previewed. And then you had a report from Reuters saying that the Model 2, that's the inexpensive electric vehicle, was killed by Elon Musk. Elon Musk has disputed that, but he's sort of been edging towards a, a change in emphasis, it's in a sense saying, no, we're, we're, we're prioritizing the, uh, the robo-taxi, which is this almost mythical product that he has been talking about for almost a decade, and yet, on the other hand, does hold a lot of promise. You know, the, the people who are really bullish on Tesla see this as the key to justifying the valuation. So you can kind of understand the, the, the tr strategy shift. Max Chafkin, we thank him. This is Bloomberg Technology.